Hello, this is Jerry Morton. Welcome to my Finding My Way podcast. This is podcast number five, titled Orders. Orders is a story from my childhood years. The collection of stories I have written and been reading to you cover many subcultures in our country that I have interacted with from childhood to my adult and senior years. A more extensive introduction to the Finding My Way stories takes place in the beginning of Podcast One. Regardless of which podcast you are listening to, you will find the story both entertaining and worthy of your reflective thoughts concerning its contents. The stories, as a collection, provide insights into a span of time that has played a role in shaping American culture and influencing its future. The stories provide you with a sense of admiration for the culture's collective courage in our country's commitment to justice and its optimistic willingness to address new challenges. Orders. The summer of 1945 was one of fun and discovery for me as a two-year-old about to turn three. It was near the beginning of July, somewhere on the outskirts of St. Louis, Missouri. My Uncle Jim and Aunt Millie, along with my two cousins, Timmy and Morning, were staying with us, that is, Daddy, Mommy, and me. Timmy was just a month younger than me, and Morning was a year and a half older than us two boys. The three of us loved to play together. I had stayed with Aunt Millie and the cousins at their place in northern Minnesota on the shores of the lake when Mommy was gone. Timmy and I didn't like going to the barber shop there. The barber shop would always yank ticks out of your head before cutting your hair. It hurt. Of course, Daddy and Uncle Jim were off at the war then. We didn't see them until after it was over. Daddy and Uncle Jim were just back from the war. We stayed at a motel of sorts that summer. Mommy said it was hard to find a place to live in right then because all of the men were coming back from the war. The motel place had lots of little houses-like places. We stayed in one of them. When it was time for bed, Daddy or Uncle Jim would sit up the army cot for all all of the cousins to sleep in. Timmy and I slept at one end of the cot, and Morning slept at the other end. Once we were in bed, I could almost touch the wall on my side of the cot. Timmy said he could almost touch the wall on his side, too. I don't remember where Mommy and Daddy or Uncle Jim and Aunt Millie slept. Daddy kept saying how great it was that it hadn't rained. Everyone would agree. There were lots of children living in the little houses just like ours. We would play with them most of the day. The games were mostly played catch, playing hide-and-seek, and things of that sort. We ran and laughed and played throughout the day. Mommy or Aunt Millie would call out our names when it was time to come to lunch or supper. We always came when we were called. If it started to get dark, we had to get back to the little house. It was bedtime. If we got back after it was dark, we might get spanked. It hurt. I never liked getting spanked. Neither did my cousins. They got spanked more than I did, especially Timmy. I felt sorry for him. He was so kind. If someone took something from him, he wouldn't do anything about it. I would not let somebody be unfair to me. I'd fight back to get my stuff. Mostly, I'd get it back. Daddy said I shouldn't fight so much. One day, we were all playing behind the little houses. 
Most of us were afraid to climb over the fence and get into the large pasture. It went a long way back to a fence that had a wooden gate. The gate had a lot of green on it and stringy things hanging down from its boards. At that distance, the gate looked small. It also looked scary. The big trees went on and on beyond that gate. The forest got darker in color the deeper you looked into it until it was almost black. On the ground near the fence and on some of the trunks of the trees was the color green. Green was supposed to be just for the leaves of trees and the grass. Not on the ground and the sides of trees. It looked scary. Some of the big boys said they had gone across the field and into the field behind the gate. They said that it made them feel funny to be in that forest. An old man lived in the forest. The last time the big Bert boys were there, the man, the, the man in the forest had tried to catch them. He yelled at them as he ran towards them trying to catch them. He was old and mean. The big boys ran back to the fence, climbed over it, and ran across the open field right back to the back of these little houses. The man stayed down there at the end of the field by the wooden gate. He just looked at them. The big boys said that we might actually see the man in the forest if we kept watching long enough. I looked and looked, as I did a lot of the other kids. Before long, the little kids started playing and running around, as we always did. I continued to look at that gate to see if the man in the woods would appear. All of a sudden, I saw him. He slowly walked out of the woods to the wooden gate. He started to crawl between the two of the widely spaced gate boards. He looked to be dull green in color. I was petrified with fear. He got through the gate and stood there looking at us with one arm resting on it. I see him, I see him, I screamed at the top of my lungs. Just He just got through the gate. All of the children began screaming and running. I continued my screams of alarm and joined the runners. We all ran to our individual little houses in deep fear of this unknown. He was real. I saw him under the wooden boards of the gate and stand up looking at us. Later that evening, Timmy asked me if I really, really saw the man. I did. To this day, I believe I saw the man or something like a man. No one else was sure that the man was there. I saw him. I was sure. Today, as an adult, I'm not so sure as to what I saw. It may have been my imagination. I'll tell you this. I saw something strange at that gate. I really did. Daddy called to me. He called me to him. I want to show you where we put the fireworks. It's in the back section of our motel cabin, he said as he guided me inside to the rear of the structure. Wow, there were sparklers, firecrackers, Roman candles, and rockets, real rockets that went up into the air. I wanted you to know that they are here. You are not to touch them. You are not allowed to touch them. Do you understand? I shook my head vigorously. Yes, sir. They are for all of us to use for the 4th of July fireworks. Only the adults are allowed to touch them. Do you understand? Yes, sir, I do. Okay, that's good. 
Now go on outside and play. Yes, sir. I was so proud of my daddy. We had the fireworks that everyone had helped buy. That was my dad. He was a leader. That's what my daddy was. Hey, your, your daddy has all the fireworks in your cabin, doesn't he? One of the three or four big boys surrounding me asked. Yes, I spoke with great pride. Well, we want to see them. I hear that there are rockets, too. We want to make a launch pad for the rockets. No, no, I'm not allowed to touch them. You're not either. Who said so? My daddy said so. Well, did he say we couldn't look at them? Well, no, but there. You see, he didn't say we couldn't look at them. We don't want them. We just want to make a ramp for the rockets. Without a ramp, they won't get high enough. We just, we just want to help. Well, um, well, okay, but don't touch them. It was agreed. I took them to the back of our cabin. Holy cow, there must be at least ten or more rockets, one of the, one of the big boys said in a hushed voice. Listen, I have to take one of the rockets and make sure I build the launch pad right. No, no, n no, I whined. You can't touch them. My, my daddy said so. We just want to help. Why won't you let us help? We'll just take one. After we put the ramp together, we'll bring it right back. We'll put it right back in the same spot it was. He'll never know it was touched, and we have it we have it perfect for the fourth. It made sense. They were really trying to help everyone. Daddy said it was good to help people. I wanted to help. I wanted everything to go right for the fourth of July. Oh, okay, but, but please bring it right back. We will. We'll be right back. They weren't gone long. When they got back, they said it was perfect. The ramp was perfect for the rockets. They put the rocket right back against the others. They put it right back where it had been. Son, come here. My daddy said in a firm voice. You moved the rocket. You were back here and moved some of these. He stated grimly as he pointed at the stacks of fireworks. I started to cry. It, it wasn't me. I, honestly, it wasn't me. That, the big boys. The big boys said they needed to make a ramp. I had to pause for a breath as my sobbing was making it hard to breathe and talk at the same time. <laughs> I ramped a launch of rockets. They only took one and, and brought it right back. I told them you said not to touch anything. They, they, they said <laughs> that you were sure you would want it to be perfect. Honest, Daddy. My sobs were beyond my control. I understand that you were trying to help. I gave you an order. You disobeyed. I will have to spank you for it. No, Daddy. No. Please, no. I screamed through my tears. He led me outside. Holding one of my arms in the air, he bent over and gave me several hard slaps on the bottom. I cried and cried. Then it was over. I have no recall of the fireworks display. <laughs>